Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. Today I'm with a very special guest, the one and only Sam LaChow. What's going on, man? Thank you so much for having me. This is a blast yeah, already. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like what I find crazy is like you've built a name for yourself like in Seattle and a lot of artists that have built their name throughout Seattle, it seems like they leave and don't come back. So what caused you to stay here in Seattle instead of moving to like LA or New York? Well, part of it is that I have an, a problem with ambition. Like I, I, I know I could, well, I fucking hate LA. First of all, I, I like visiting, but I can't live there. This, mm -hmm. There's neighborhoods there that I like, but whenever I go there, I just start feeling down on myself. I feel like I need to go get a tan and start working out way more and, and, and eat kale salad. And you know, and I'm like, I like being able to walk around Seattle in my hoodie looking like shit. Um, and, uh, but I know if I move down there, I think I am going to move down there for like, just like a year, just so I can tell myself I did. Cause I know I'll meet some great connections and, um, mostly would just want to uh, meet new collaborators. I bet there's some incredible artists that, you know, I'm, I'm being silly to not at least give it a shot, but, um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm lucky enough to be able to work from wherever and make a living doing it. I can work from home. I can move to, you know, I've been considering moving to like Montana or somewhere just r super rural because, you know, I'm not all that interested in uh, all the big connections you can make in the big cities because I'm sort of in a unique position where I don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. What I've heard from like LA artists is that like studio hopping is pretty big in LA though. So you like go through one studio meet some cool artists fucking like yg or someone will randomly pull up and it's just like, yeah yeah which is pretty no cool. don't definitely really would love here, to though, do, do that we? yeah we don't really have that here at all um i'm it's very uh well especially now it's a very isolated solo thing and then um yeah and then you just kind of like i make all my music here at home now oh shit um but then I, but then I bring it to a legit studio or or send it to somebody to mix that's better than me you know so I don't do it all here, but, mm -hmm. um, I find that, um, I used to do it all in the studio and you're kind of under pressure. You're under time constraints, you know, that you're paying for the hours. Um, you're also in front of an engineer that you don't know all that well. And that, it, the, the, my creativity, sometimes I like to be just me and my computer. I've always been sort of a solo guy. Oh yeah. yeah. So, you know, Elon, Wright. Do you go to the Ruby room ever? To oh yeah. I love working with those guys. Hell yeah. Yeah, they're the best. But yeah, I, I've noticed, like, because I've only been doing the podcast for a little bit over a year, and, like, it's the generations of, like, artists throughout Seattle area, the new generations, the older generations, I feel mm -hmm. like they do a pretty good job of, like, connecting in a way. Like, there's definitely totally. barriers, but, like, older artists and new artists definitely, like, know each other, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we all know each other for sure. I came up and I, I don't know what my, we should, we should think of names for the, the, the different generations. <laughs> yeah. Would we be the, I don't know. But mine was like, you know, the Gifted Gabs and the Dave B's and the, um, the yeah, a whole bunch of people. But, and, uh, and I came up listening to like the Blue Scholars and stuff. And, uh, and now the young guys, the younger generation is, you know, we got the Travis Thompsons and the Lil Moseys, of course. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting, but we all know each other. Yeah. What is kind of annoying that like the newer generation after Little Mosey, they're all kind of trying to copy his sound in Seattle, which is hella annoying. Yeah, I've been trying to think about that, about is copying sound like super annoying or or when you're yet that young, is that all you can do sort of? Because like when I was that young, I was definitely sounding like everyone I listened to, mm -hmm. you know? Well, I think it's different because like, realistically like who, whoever you are in seattle whether you're just a fan or an artist no one really listens to like macklemore they don't really they yeah. see they see like little mosey as the guy who actually made it through seattle so like they're like oh if he can do it maybe i can do yeah it yeah Th doing. that's when it gets problematic or at least for like from a creative come from a creative standpoint is uh is it's not really that they're trying to copy a certain style it's that they're trying to do what they think will work to blow up hell yeah and then yeah and their idea of success is blowing up success okay. is um is being able to make the music that they want to make because that's what they love to do and you know ideally making a living off it um i think there's a lot of maybe pressure to uh 
that you're not shit unless you, you unless you have number one singles and stuff you know mm -hmm. um for me it was never i was never trying to copy a sound that was huge to get huge in any way it was like this is something i would do regardless of if it made me a living you know it's just something i have to do it's just you know it's in me yeah but you freaking started like a boy band growing up kind of i don't know if you want to call <laughs> it a boy band but like that's that not a really boy like band. a common thing you know i mean i think we liked the term rap group but boy band is <laughs> <laughs> but yeah like you don't really like that's different in itself like sound well, that's exactly you know. and that's exactly it we were just doing it because it was the most fun thing ever we were having a blast. We were not doing it to like, you know, get, yeah. We and, and at that point, you didn't even really think that was possible. Now, when kids blow up at the age of 16 off SoundCloud or whatever, um, people see that as, whoa, that's a possibility. For me, you know, cause I'm old, fucking that, that didn't even seem like, and even on our radar that we might blow up. <laughs> mm -hmm we were making it for our high school and and then it started spreading to other high schools and that's when i was like oh wow there might be actually something might actually be something real for me mm -hmm. you know so the audience who doesn't know what your rap group was what give a little tiny breakdown about who your rap group was oh man it was me and my two best friends in, in washington middle school and then a, a third friend or a fourth friend um we we would always make pretend that uh, we wouldn't let him in the group, but he was on all, he was on a ton of the songs. <laughs> but um, that was sort of our like little skit that that Skyler always wanted to be part of the group, but wasn't allowed to be. <laughs> but uh, it was just us. We were called Shankbone. You can find the one and only Shankbone album. Well, we had a ton of albums, but the only one that ever like wasn't filled with samples and we were able to get it on iTunes and stuff. It's just called Shankbone. And it's on, uh, um, I think it's on Spotify and everything. And uh, it's a little embarrassing, um, but it's a fun trip down memory lane. I think we were... I don't remember how old we were, but at that point we were at Garfield High School. And then the band sort of broke up after we all went our separate ways after high school. We're still great friends to this day, but I was always the one who was the front runner. And the, I was always the one that like took it the most seriously. I made all the beats, you know. Um, so, and then so, someone that I met in New York kind of convinced me to... Um, because I was still making music, but I didn't know what to go by. I didn't really like just going by Sam LaChow. And then he convinced me, just just go by your name and just do your solo thing. And um, yeah, I'm still trying to find a name to this day. <laughs> but what happens like when people want autographs? Because I, I didn't realize it, but it's a thing. Like if you're going to use your actual signature, people can like forge that. If you're using your Whoa. signature and your autograph <laughs> to be the same thing. Damn, I did not ever think of that once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's definitely the same signature. Oh shit! Be about that. So yeah, too late. In the era of like making CDs and stuff, uh, and when there wasn't SoundCloud, you could basically just upload your CD after a while to like iTunes and then put that on SoundCloud, right? Is like, did people ever upload their CDs to SoundCloud or other streaming services once they came around? Or oh man, I don't know. I don't even like. We had a MySpace. That was okay. that was our main thing. Um, but we we were we were hustling CDs in school. Like I was coming home with stacks of cash, <laughs> five dollars a CD, I think it was, maybe ten. I don't remember. And it was like we would, you know, we would do a little like people knew that we'd be talking some shit about people at school on the on the <laughs> album, and like so people actually wanted it. Even the people that like really hated it, you know, that we had a lot of haters, of course, because like, um you know rightfully so <laughs> we were these you know the older kids we were these three young kids fucking white kids making rap music in high school like and like getting attention for it and stuff and we were just like fucking around um but even that even they would buy it i remember they'd kind of <laughs> they'd like get someone to buy it for them just so they could go home and listen to it and see what we're talking about yeah that's but, funny uh, it's like it's like peer pressure at that point, kind of too. Like, oh shit, they bought it. I guess I have to buy it now too. Versus well, I like want to SoundCloud or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can't pretend. You can't. They can't listen to it. 
find it on the internet. They, they have to, yeah, go face to face and ask you for the CD. <laughs> yeah, that's freaking crazy. But people still like release CDs and vinyls. Like, have you released any albums on? Vinyl? I release. Oh, so my first vinyl um, is my latest album. It's called Corduroy. <laughs> Uh, this is just a poster of it oh shit um oh yeah that's my dog dev this isn't the actual vinyl it's just a poster but uh fucking yeah my first time doing vinyl my uh manager convinced me and and uh um it was uh, we we did a little campaign through a company called q rates where you basically they don't start pressing the vinyl until you sell a certain amount mm. um and we made our goal in like a day and I was, it's really shocked me because I didn't, I thought, uh, you know, who has record players? But it's sort of more of the novelty, I think. Even people without record players kind of want, they like collecting these things. And mm-hmm. um, so I definitely plan on making vinyl for every project moving forward. And I recommend any artist to do the same. Hell yeah. So in your Justin Frick video, I think it was Lady Sunday. Yeah. The, your cover art was in the video. So like, was that, an, was that just like a green screen or how did the, is that an actual like wall? Um, yes, it's, it's uh, I actually made a post on my Instagram. If you scroll down a little bit, you'd find it um, where we showed the exact how, how we did it pretty much, mm. it's a, but just a slides of pictures. But um, I sort of was, um, I sort of had an image in my head of what I wanted the album to be. And then I had my little brother who can draw sort of sketch it out for me. And we, we kind of came up with something we liked. And then I hit up Justin Frick and asked if he could, uh, if he think he'd be able to make this a reality. And I knew I wanted it to be a real photo. I was just looking through tons of different of my favorite album covers. And I realized I love when they're real photos rather than um, drawings or, or uh, you know, animated. Um, and I knew I wanted my dog in it. And <laughs> that's pretty much all I knew. But then we made this design. And yeah, Justin just ordered this uh, fake wallpaper on Amazon. Hmm. They, we went to their studio. They taped it to the wall, um, busted out their lights. Everything in the photo is real except for the, um, what's inside the mirror. That was okay. 3D animation that we uh, hired out for. It kind of reminds me of a, it wasn't the latest one, it's the second to latest one of the Mac Miller albums. Oh, that, um, the framing is, the is I, was, is, I was actually sort of inspired by, I love the exact frame. If, if, if you're talking about the one where he's shirtless, I think um, no, it's the it's the last one. The last no, the last one he just had was circles. The one right. Before. Oh, I don't know. The one that that it reminds me of a little bit is the one where he's sitting shirtless with okay. a red Movie's red one. behind him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just because um, I just like the simplicity of it. And there's a ton of album covers that inspired me. I think I posted them all in the in the slide. Mm-hmm. Um. I was really inspired by sort of like, like Pink Floyd and and uh, old seventies bands that w- when they just kind of did weird shit. You know, I wanted it to when people saw the album cover to really have no idea what kind of music it was going to be or what to expect. It's crazy, but like freaking album color- covers are like half the battle with making an album real- realistically. Like people say, don't judge a book by its cover, but like everyone. Does. Oh man, yeah, everyone does, and uh, yeah, sometimes it takes me the longest because I realize how important it is. Mm-hmm. So being a white rapper, do you get fucking compared to like Mac Miller and, and Mac Moore? I used to all the time. Like I would, I would get compared to literally like any white rapper, to, like no matter how different we sounded, it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. And that's just, but that's everyone, you know? Um, but now I'm sort of, um, and I used to like, music used to all be about partying and, uh, one of my biggest songs was about smoking weed and you know so i had this stoner white rapper stigma um that i did to myself you know it wasn't something that i thought was unjust (laughs) Mm -hmm. but i break out of that but i'm definitely like you know i'm getting older and i'd like to be thought of as much more of an artist and creative in general than like a stoner white rapper guy and i'm also rapping a lot less i'm still making hip-hop music i still love the beats um but I've been getting a lot more into singing more and uh, 
just trying to just keep evolving and growing. You know, I'm not I'm not the 22 year old kid I was. You might like this comparison or not, but you're kind of evolving like Mac Miller, though. You know, like yeah, out I totally. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say his trajectory really inspired me because mm-hmm. um, we were sort of doing it at the same time. Him, obviously, on a much bigger level, but um, the way he sort of yeah like i can totally see comparisons to how where his direction was going towards where mine is going and and sort of what you know he did what 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 inspired him um he wasn't he wasn't trying to do what you know because he could have easily kept making uh whatever donald trump's songs what, what's oh that? shit yeah i forgot about that yeah it's hard to even say the name of that song now <laughs> but um like he could have kept making that music and probably sold a lot more records but then he went like Larry Fisherman, I remember route. Like oh, he, he did he did like a whole, you know, which sold nothing. And mm-hmm. uh, but it's what he wanted to do. And um, and I've always respected that about him so much. Yeah, it's um it might sound cringy, but there's a difference between like good music and like beautiful music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It depends what you mean by good music. I, mean, I don't know. I, I just kid. like um I was I was kind of taken back by your latest album. It was it was dope as fuck. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it was a very mature well, album. I felt like for you. Oh, that's so good to hear, man. Thanks. Now now this interview is the best. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> praises praises. I appreciate that. So what well, made yes. you stick? What I also like appreciate about your music, like, is it does seem like you actually are connected with like the whole entire Seattle music scene, like the whole album was full of like Seattle artists and like you really don't see that especially with yeah. artists who have made a name for themselves it doesn't seem like they even want to look towards a feature from Seattle artists yeah um I, for, uh, a couple things I could say about that is I've always I just love collaboration um because it's fun and it's that's sort of I don't really just hang out and kick it these days I like to hang out and make shit you know um, that is my kick in it. So like, I like to hang out with my friends and make music. So it's, you know, these are all people I'm friends with, but also I don't put people on my stuff because they're from Seattle or because they're my friend. Mm. I'm genuinely fans of these people. And um, I genuinely like how we sound together. I like people that sound very different from me, you know? So like, I, you know, I like a song that's, I have a verse and then uh, Gabby, Gifted Gab has a verse because we, we the contrast I love you know um same with like Dave B I love rapping with Nacho because he has such a different style I mean Nacho Picasso um and for some reason whenever we get on a song together I always really like that song Mm -hmm. um and and I'm just not all that talented musically (laughs) like I'm I'm, uh, there's things that I'm very good at but uh like I I can't sing for shit so I I get Ariana DeBu or someone who can and 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 I love, I love hearing something that I've written sung by someone who can actually sing. And I'm like, wow, I wrote that. That sounds way better than what I thought it would sound like. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's mostly just me working with being lucky enough to have all this talent around. Yeah, it definitely seems like when you collaborate with Dave B, he like brings something out of you, though, for sure. Yeah. And uh, something about collaboration that uh, makes me want to be better. I don't know if it's competitive vibe or what, but uh, um yeah, it's not just it's not just me, <laughs> I guess. It's the community. It's just yeah, it's very inspiring. Like sometimes, like for the podcast, even like I've been just stuck at home for like majority of the time, and then like I'll feel yeah, down well, sometimes, but I feel like and then I remember like I'm actually part of like a huge fucking community in Seattle. The, mm-hmm. the music scene is very inspiring, even if there can be some like flaws. Like, well, the people that you surround yourself with can really inspire you. Totally, man. Have uh, you um, found the podcast to be helpful in, with your mental health during this time? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's weird. Like I um, sometimes I've, I've definitely had some ups and downs during this pandemic. And I feel like sometimes I'll go like a week or two. The longest I've gone without doing a podcast episode since I started was like two weeks. Mm-hmm. And then like if I'm about to do an interview, if it's been like a two week long hiatus, I'll actually get like nervous. And then as, oh, soon, wow, as, yeah. as soon as I start just talking to someone, I, I just remember they're like they're part of my community and like they chose to be talking to me. They didn't have to talk to me. Like 
we're just talking about totally. music and it's totally it's it's definitely different than music i feel like especially because it seems like you've been going through a lot during this whole pandemic i feel like a podcast yeah, yeah. for you would definitely uh help you out yeah actually. i would like to uh yeah i have some ideas for it i'm excited about a lot of it will be just sort of therapeutic for me to talk about what where i met with my uh with my addiction and shit like that and 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 sort of just keep my fans updated um yeah because I, I i didn't really realize that my fan base or sort of fan bases music fans in general they really like to get to know the artist more than just the records they put out and yeah, for some reason that never age. yeah for some reason that never clicked with me and, I, and i'd like them to know me more you know yeah that's something that i'm working on and uh being more open because i really when, when i'm open and honest especially on social media i find it to be really healthy and actually good for my mental health when i'm pretending like everything's okay on social media it seems to i, I feel shittier so yeah. yeah and though like i feel like your fans would probably understand like if you're taking like a different approach towards music i feel like they'll appreciate it better versus like if you take a break and you just release something that's out of this world and that everyone's like, what? This doesn't sound like Sam Chow. But if you're like, yeah. if they're following the podcast and they see what's actually yeah. going on, then they're like, oh, you don't understand. And then people that aren't listening to the podcast, they'll compare it to the people that are. And they're like, the people that listen to the podcast will be like, oh, you don't understand this music? Well, you should have been checking out his podcast. To understand that's like a, this actually makes sense. That's a great point. That just gave me chills. I want that. Uh, that's exactly what I want. I want them to be following the journey and the pot. Yeah, I think that's a great way. Yeah, like um, I was watching your uh, you released it a month ago, but like your addiction, your relapse on YouTube. The relapse, like, that yeah, must have yeah, been yeah. that must have been hella scary, though. Honestly, um, it was really scary, but it was uh, it, it was more of a weight off because I'd been um, like hiding from comments and messages of people being like i'm so proud of you and your and your uh your sobriety and you know mm. and and in my head i'm i know that i relapsed and but i, I don't want to tell them that because i because um i'm inspiring them right now and i'm scared i'm like what's re what's a responsible thing to do like you know i don't want to tell them hey i relapsed and you can too <laughs> of course but like <laughs> <laughs> but like uh you know because i inspire uh, it was very humbling at the amount of people that said I, I inspired them to kind of try to get healthy and um so that was it was really scary to admit to them that I've messed up um but I talked to a lot of people and you know it's it's more human to admit that you mess up rather than um pretend that I got sober once and then and just succeeded and and cracked the code because that's not how it works at all mm -hmm. and just you know to remind them that I don't know what the hell I'm doing no one does here yeah. just in this in this life and that people fuck up um so it was a weight off but um and that's but uh, yeah and i want to keep people sort of updated um I'm, it's still something i'm struggling with right now um and i i'm figuring out how to say this you you can talk about it all you want or post whatever you want but um in four on the 28th oh damn three fucking days i just checked myself at a rehab because uh I could feel, I'm feeling it start to, I'm sober right now and everything. I mean, at this moment, but it wasn't, it's been, it's been a, but it's been a rough one and it's just been, it's, it's not fun for me anymore. It's very isolating, especially cause I'm, I'm quarantined, <laughs> but um, I could feel it start to spiral. So I decided to just try to nip it in the bud before it got bad. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of a perfect time. You know, I'm actually really excited to get the hell out of, my apartment and uh and meet people and be you know because everyone has to get tested and we're all gonna you know, be chilling and i got my insurance to cover it so that's something mm -hmm. that's amazing what's out there if you can um you know i got apple care through washington so to any listeners going through it it's it's possible to get to to get get to treat treatment or inpatient for free three meals a day baby Hell my own man. room can't complain yeah, you were talking on the, I think it was on the biggest podcast. You were like, at first you're like contemplating it because it's rehab can be hella fucking expensive. Yeah, that's why I, I, so I was kind of, I was almost kind of like bummed when I found out that my insurance could cover this one because then I was like, damn, now I no gotta go. Out. Yeah, <laughs> that was my big reason. Um, so, and uh, what they do is they make you call every day. I had to call every day at 8 a.m., which 
I didn't understand that. What kind of junkie is up at 8 a.m. unless they've been fucking <laughs> doing drugs all night and haven't slept? So, um, but yeah, but they want to make sure that you're serious about it, I guess, which makes sense. So that it's not just like you're hungover once and you're like, I'm, you know, how you get hungover mm. and decide you're never drinking again. And then the next day you're like, fuck it. So they want to know you're serious. And then finally one day they said, all right, you're in. Wow. And uh, I just had to get like a medical clearance and do a little interview. And yeah, now I'm going. It's like winning a scholarship for rehab. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When I got the call, I was like, oh. <laughs> mom. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. I told my mom right away. She was like. <laughs> I was um, like a few interviews ago, I was talking to Ray Dalton. And um, we were talking about how we felt that 2021 is like an extension of 2020. You know, it doesn't really yeah. feel like the year has started over. And uh it just feels like one long year, even though you can't really say it's been a long year anymore because it's a new year. But yeah. um, I, I, I definitely feel like a lot of people at first, like, because they, especially in, I feel like they did it everywhere, but in Washington, you know, they like were like, oh, it's going to be like two weeks, the beginning, like back in March. And they're like, oh, actually, it's going to be a month. Oh, actually, blah, 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 blah. So like they kept pushing it back. So people were kind of, they had hope. Yeah. But now like, we're still realistically like in a lockdown. No one really wants to call it a lockdown, but we're yeah. definitely like still locked down. Totally. And um, I feel like people don't really have hope right now. And yeah, I I feel differently right now. Just for some reason, since the inauguration, it really gave me a sense that it made, made this feel like a new year to mm. me. Um, felt like times were legit starting to change. I I saw an I saw an interesting interview on um msnbc of um obama bill clinton and george bush all all three of them together um talking about the you know um the peaceful transition of power and, and donald trump wasn't there and it almost <laughs> it almost felt like trump was just this bad dream and wow. like and so seeing those three guys together talking to, you know because trump didn't show up um it was just kind of like man maybe we are kind of past this thing you know i think He's going to have his, he's going to keep trying to be a celebrity and he's going to have his followers and stuff. Um, but, and, and still half the country, of course, I don't want to get into politics, but obviously mm -hmm. half the country still disagrees with the other half. But um, yeah, I don't know. Something feels new since the inauguration. It gave me some hope. Yeah. It's like at this point, the Trump thing's kind of like a cult and we kind of brush aside cults in a way. So it's totally. not as a. Which, which is um, sort of unfair to them because there's there, um, there's so fucking many of them, and and you know, by brushing them aside is kind of what makes it worse. It makes us not, makes us more divided, maybe. But yeah. what do I know? And kind of dangerous too. There's plotters yeah. out there. Oh, so scary. But yeah, back to like the extension. Like it, it's good though. I'm happy that you feel like it's like a new start. I'm almost mm -hmm. there. I feel like. Nice. I feel like this um this month randomly has gone by crazy fast. Like I I can't even believe that it's almost February already. God, yeah. But I feel like um especially if someone has like a platform, they should be using it to like inspire during these times cuz I feel like a lot of people's mental health health at this point is starting to wane. Yeah. Even like the most happiest people are like starting to actually like sink in that this virus isn't really a joke. Like even like up north and like in the Snohomish area, like the new strain of COVID nineteen. Now oh it's, it's I think it's going to be called COVID twenty now, you know, because it's oh, wow. twenty twenty one, I guess. But um, the U the new strain from the UK has finally like arrived in Washington. So hopefully these vaccines work out. But because it's actually mutated, it just might prolong how long this COVID yeah. thing's going on. But I mean, it's not our fault that we treated it like a joke. We are literally the leader of our country was saying it's just going to magically disappear. <laughs> With Clorox or bleach or whatever. Remember that? Yeah, well, there was that too. But then he was also just saying it's, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be a miracle. It's going to be, we'll be, we'll all be at Christmas Sunday, Christmas church. <laughs> or no, no, Easter Sunday. It's, a, <laughs> it's been a long ride. Yeah. I remember when uh, it first hit in my show that was like was the sold out show in Seattle that was like three weeks away. I thought that was still going to go down. <laughs> I mm. thought it'd be over by then. How naive was I? Goddamn. So 
was it where was it at because i remember on the biggest podcast you were saying you wanted to resell out showbox is it Showbox? yeah um no so this was we did two nights at chop suey uh so oh. it's like it's sort of that my kind of going back to my it was the first show i've ever played was at chop suey so okay. i wanted to do small intimate shows and just two different nights of them mm-hmm. um but the goal that but that was way before my new album was out so i didn't really i didn't i didn't feel, feel like i would deserve to try to sell out showbox um mm-hmm. Now that's definitely my goal. Now that I now that I'm back on the scene, you know, and, and consistently putting out stuff, but then I was on a sort of a hiatus. It was sort of just more of a show to kind of get me playing shows again. Start, right. you know, and then um, and then quarantine hit. Those that shows got canceled, and then I had a tour coming up with my friend Saul, and that t- when that tour got canceled, that's when I realized this thing was no joke, and uh, that's basically when I relapsed too because I was like you know, one of the reasons I was sober was because I, I was starting to not show up to shows or, or show up drunk or whatever. And then when all my shows got canceled, I was, you know, my mind started to wander. It's like, shit, maybe you can get away with it this time. So there's a difference between like drinking and smoking and like recording in the studio, but like, how does it affect you when like you're performing? Like, are you actually able to stay? Well, what's fucked is that is, it, um, I don't smoke before because smoking it doesn't make me charismatic. But like I would, I would drink be a little before and then drink on stage and uh, and there would be some nights where you just have a really great performance because mm-hmm. your all your fear is gone and but then those nights will make you think that that'll happen every time and then you start up in the dose a little bit and then and it drinking is just one of those things that. Um, we say it works until it doesn't it doesn't always it starts you know as you get older it it starts affecting your body differently it starts affecting you differently so like because I had that one show where I was in a super good mood and killing it and on a perfect buzz level that's um that started making me drink before every show because I'm like why not and then and then it starts not working and now you're sloppy on stage and uh yeah hope that answers your question yeah I feel like fans notice that too. Like I've I've um had friends totally. like, oh yeah, I was so excited for this concert, and then the fucking guy was shit faced yeah. the entire concert and like slurring his words and like actually fan that actually makes fans sometimes not want to go see that artist again. Totally, and it ha- that's happened to me. And I, for being on stage, you don't realize it. You think you killed it sometimes, and then people will <laughs> be like, oh, you were clearly fucked up. <laughs> like, have you um have you seen Wolf on Wall Street? Yeah. Like that. My favorite scene is when um. Well, Leonardo is like, and he's, he said, I drove home perfectly. And then they do the <laughs> rewind and he fucking hit every single thing on the yeah. way home. <laughs> oh, that's great. I forgot about that scene. That's so good. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're throwing shows in Seattle, do people from out of Seattle come to Seattle? Or like, have you built like a big enough fan base that when people well, are coming can... to see your shows, just Seattleites? Uh, people come out just because they want to see me in my hometown. Um, because they know I, 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 that's where I do it the biggest. Mm-hmm. So I definitely have a, lots of people come get hotels and stuff for my Seattle shows. But um, I also now can headline tours, which is awesome. So I, so they, like, they used to have to come to Seattle to see me because I wouldn't tour because I wasn't, I didn't have enough of a fan base. But I had like a few diehards in Spokane, you know, but not enough to play Spokane. But right or like a few diehards in, in California or Oregon or something. And um, and they would have to come to Seattle to see me. But now I, whenever I tour, I do all the West Coast, all the different small towns in Washington, Oregon, and down the coast, you know. Hell yeah. Do you have a pretty good relationship with like all the venues in Seattle? I know a lot of Seattle artists are like, yeah, I, I know they have to, to perform not... in Seattle, but they like, the venues don't support them really. Yeah. Um, I mean, it took a long, t- it t- you gotta not hold grudges, you know. I, like I uh, definitely got had some situations that left me with a bad taste in my mouth in some venues in Seattle back in the day when they uh, they just wouldn't believe that I could draw a crowd or didn't just were really unresponsive, just were treating me like I was no one, you know. And instead of letting that get to me, um, just kept working, you know. And uh, now they're offering me us um, what's it called um, like a set amount of money, no matter how many tickets I sell. And once you oh, get there, shit. that's when like they, they trust that you're going to sell it out mm-hmm. um and you can either take 
you know, you either take the door deal, say, no, nah, I'll just take, or you take their, their deal and, uh, and not have to stress. And, and they're like good deals. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think my relationship got good. And yeah, once you build a track record, it gets good, obviously my relation, but I definitely had experiences where when I was very unprofessional and like, I was literally letting all my homies backstage and it was just a party. Shit was getting stolen. Fights were breaking out. I remember at one point Nacho and I played Chop Suey and it ended up being the last rap concert that Chop Suey did for like so long oh, because of just because of how, how shit went down backstage because they were not did not have enough security. Um, and uh, but now, uh, yeah, it was so stressful. <laughs> Think about I feel it. Like, I feel like Nacho can definitely probably bring on a rough crowd, too. No, it was me. Me, too, man. Like, yeah. we, we all we all kicked in the same circle. We just we are it was just always a party with us everywhere we went was a party mm-hmm. um it wasn't bad people or anything like that just uh you know drunk people <laughs> yeah so how'd you get connected with like nacho and raz simone and all those guys i know you um i know the story behind raz but not as much behind like nacho um or st- basically or just the central district where i grew up and um and going to garfield and could friends of friends um like with nacho i remember i was a fan of him before we ever were friends and then um met him sometime and then we did a show together and then we became very close like just kind of down the line from working together but mostly from fucking doing cocaine together (laughs) (laughs) um and uh me and dave have mostly just always been about the music and we knew each other through mutual friends gab i met um through mutual friends in the CD. I saw one of her, someone posted on Facebook, just a video of her rapping. And I, I put her on her first ever like actual song. It's called oh, wow. My House, her actual song and video. It's called My House. Um, me and my homie Shakir and, uh, and, and Gabby. She might've just been Gabby at that point, not Gift to Gab. Hmm. Um, and yeah, it's just a scene thing. But now I, I don't hang out with those people nearly as much as I used to because life isn't a bit well it's also quarantine but like you know as you get older you stop uh, being able to party like we used to so that's you know i mostly see these people um when we're working on music so it's kind of also why i like to work with my friends it's just an excuse to kick it <laughs> yeah what the what the hell do fucking older artists do together do they play like chess and what <laughs> <laughs> no i think they like to they make music and then we, you know uh you know, I get coffee with these guys and catch up and, yeah. um, uh, yeah, it used to be, I would go get drinks with them and stuff. And, and, uh, that hasn't, you know, I was sober. And then when I, what, when I relapsed, bars were all shut down. So I haven't oh, been shit. to a bar in a long over a year. Yeah. Mm. Isn't Nacho yeah. sober, right? Yeah. Yeah. He, he's been a huge inspiration to me. I, I, uh, text with him all the time he's in LA so we don't kick it but mm. I uh you know he was he I would text him every when I when I got sober for 250 days I was texting him every like 10 days like I'm still doing it oh, yeah. he would give me words of encouragement you know um because him and I were animals I bet. <laughs> just like just sniffing everything in sight and then uh and he got sober before me um and I couldn't believe he was able to do it I mean I hate the word sober it was like you know he the man smokes weed he does because yeah. i don't know it's it's more just he, he stopped killing himself <laughs> would you ever stopped. thought weed would have been legal in washington um no i never would have thought I'd, i would have thought that like there would be some medical that that made sense to me i never would have thought it would be so normalized to have a, a place on the corner where i grew up in the central district on fucking 23rd union that okay. says weed <laughs> back when <laughs> back where like my homies were getting locked up for selling weed on that exact same corner yeah that's crazy <laughs> yeah that was uh will never seem normal to me mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah i had a I had an interview with jar of d the other day and he was just talking about like when he came up he was basically like overall like five different groups actually like that's insane. That yeah, like, I, yeah. I liked all his groups too. <laughs> yeah, and Nacho, I, 
fucking i keep having like a i keep setting up an interview with nacho and um his new group and then just they're all like all over the place so it's kind of hard to tag them all down but like the cyanide yeah, yeah, syndicate's are... pretty cool too oh i really like the project and uh and i like all those guys a lot i'm friends with them and uh the, but groups are hard man yeah i'm surprised they decided to start to do a group because just after all the groups that like nacho's been a part of and and keniata has been a part of like Mm-hmm. it's a lot of ego it's a lot of um it's just it's just it's just complicated trying yeah. to get everyone on the same page and um yeah i don't know if i was to do a group it would be a just a duo and i've considered doing a kind of run the jewel style group oh shit but um just because i, I want to find ways to rebrand to try you know to experiment with different things it's not just the sandwich chow brand because I, I enjoy th- branding and, and uh you know, make a new merch. Do you and Raz not count as a duo? No. Um, and there's weird shit going on with him right now. So, um, that I'd rather not talk about. Yeah, Yeah. of course. No worries. (laughs) Yeah. I've I've made the decision to not speak publicly on that stuff based on, uh, my mentors telling me to, uh, to, yeah, not to at least, at Mm. least till my head's clear and I'm out of treatment and shit. So, how long does that last? Like, are you going to be away for like a few weeks, few months? 30 days. And I think the craziest part, honestly, is no phones. No so shit. I feel like the, I, I, I don't know if I fucked up with my settings, but last night I got a thing that told me how long I'd been on my phone, my, my daily um, average. And it was like eight hours a day. Oh, shit. I was like, oh my, what? Eight hours, and, damn. But I guess it counts, like, obviously past midnight as part of the day. So, you know, and I'm, pro- I'm sure I'm constantly texting. So I guess it makes sense. And then I texted my friends, and they were all, like, at nine hours a day. I'm like, okay, that makes me feel better. But mm. damn, that's crazy. So, like, I feel like every day that I'm in treatment, I'm going to realize a new another app that I, that I didn't realize how uh, essential it was to my daily life. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to be like, oh, let me just look that up real quick. Oh, fuck yeah so that's gonna happen what i tell all my friends though like if i'm hanging out with them i say the phone is the devil so they stay off their phones (laughs) um my little brother would agree with you um he's he's sort of conspiracy with that stuff too it's not even really conspiracy it's all true but like the way that your phone is constantly selling you stuff is crazy yes i my i was with my family and we were randomly talking about we were like, oh, the FedEx pack has just arrived. And then randomly we were talking about one-handed push-ups. And then later that night, out of nowhere, there was an ad with a FedEx guy doing a one-handed push-up. Yep. Like, how random is – who would make an ad about a FedEx guy doing a one-handed push-up? Oh, no. It's, it's a, it's a, they've admitted it now. It's a fact. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And one thing that I do now is – uh, um so they this is fucked up but they made it they recently made it more difficult to turn off your bluetooth and wi-fi Hmm. so you can you can you know do you have an iphone i have a google phone which some people would say is worse because google is fucking everything yeah yeah well an iphone they switched it used to be you could swipe down and then uh just tap the bluetooth and the wi-fi button and they would turn off and and now it makes you it makes them go off but there's still you have to go into settings it's just way more difficult. You have to go deep into your settings and switch one, each one off, or they're Mm. still, you're still tracked. And it's so they can, uh, you know, see what restaurants you're going to like, you know, this, uh, you know, 30 year old white male spends a lot of time at this coffee shop. Let's market this coffee shop to more of them, you know, that kind of thing. Oh my God. Um, yeah, pretty wild. So you're a coffee guy. Um, uh yeah more of just a. it's it's the alternative to the other shit i was i'm an upper guy okay i kind of need so that's why i like 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 cocaine and meth and shit was my and like adderall and shit were my like uh most problematic drugs for me because i Mm. like to work i like to make 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 music on them and and, uh go 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 you know um so yeah now and now when i'm off that shit I, i gotta drink a lot of coffee is a does exercise help with that? I know like some people feel way better after exercise or like yeah. running or I if I yeah, I mean they're all they're they're all like very temporary solutions. Like honestly, yeah. Um 
like there's you know my alcoholism isn't going to be cured by working out every day it's a much deeper rooted problem than that but um it definitely helps and what, what exercising every day makes me sleep so much better too mm-hmm. um so i try so it's nice out today so i'm definitely gonna hoop but uh and uh, right now my little brother's my roommate which has been a huge blessing oh, wow. um so he's in my bubble so I, you know so um because i gotta be real careful right now or they won't let me into treatment if i show stuck signs of covid oh, sure. um so i'm only kicking it with him and so yeah i'm gonna wake his ass up and try to get him to hoop right now actually he stays yeah. he stays up playing video games like 5 a.m yeah you posted like your little brother like a while ago on your youtube and that was so how old is your little brother now it's it's weird to say like little siblings when they're probably crazy like... 21 oh shit <laughs> Yeah. trippy <laughs> not so little any- anymore i guess yeah yeah and he can ball me up now on the court oh my he's gosh. filthy is there a what part of seattle do you live in right now i'm living in capitol hill um okay. sort of sort of right in between the cd and capitol hill so i'm uh it's kind of called the valley mm-hmm. um yeah how do you, um yeah how do you feel about like all the the parks around Capitol Hill, you know, Cal Anderson and all that shit? Um, well, it's interesting because uh, every single day I'm about to go after this, I take my dog to uh, Miller. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I say it pretty openly, whatever. Um, oh, sometimes shit. fans. Sometimes, <laughs> I don't want to be like, oh. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, uh, there's some fan. I've, sometimes fans see, uh, will go there and, to see me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, this only happened a couple of times because they see it on my story. Instagram story but yeah I go, I go to Miller and it's completely surrounded by tents right oh. um the whole thing and it used to be none of that um and I empathize with, it's they're all drug addicts pretty much for the most part it's not at first I thought it was um I thought it was like people that were just out of luck because of COVID and like couldn't yeah. afford rent but it's 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 drug addicts that kind of most of them leaked off from from Shaz and Chop you know Mm-hmm. um and and kind of had nowhere else to go but i empathize with, with drug addicts a lot obviously and i know it's not as easy as just t- you know telling them to stop like all of these people don't want to stop you know they're they're it's an addiction um so um, i definitely don't want to just like kick them all out or something but i'm actually working with this group called uh teen feed okay. who um um i'm helping promote them and uh donating i'm unfortunately can't um volunteer i tried to volunteer but they weren't taking any more right now because of covid and now i'm going to rehab but after rehab i hope to get really involved because volunteering is a, a, like similar to exercise it's a great way to um, keep your mind right and not focus on yourself so much so i'm yeah. sort of selfishly volunteering <laughs> mm. like i'm doing it for myself in a way to to remember that that it's not all about me and that I can't get all consumed with self-centered fear and, and, you know, it really helps with depression I find. So anyway, yeah, they basically, cause a lot of these people that live in the tents are like between the ages of like 18 and 23 or oh, like shit. 16 and 23. And um, they could really, and they're so outcasted from the community and this, and this organization sort of gets them involved in the community, tries to, you know, um, uh, gives them meals, um, uh, hooks them up with healthcare so they can try to just, you know, things that to try to fix a solution. Um, and, I, and it annoys me when people say, well, aren't they just like perpetuating the problem? Are they giving them, and, it, and, it's, like, and it's just, it's so not that. They're, they need hope. Yeah. And they need to be involved in the community. They can't, you know, it, um, yeah. Like if, if you're, if, the, if your definition of fixing the solution is just kicking them all, like, getting a bunch of cops to come kick them all out They're, you know that's not gonna help anybody Mm-mm. yeah um, sorry if i'm rambling man no no worries i uh i really think like the for me at least like one of the biggest words two of the biggest words during like the pandemic for me is like self growth growth and um community mm-hmm. and like when i can't be part of my community I'm not doing podcast mm-hmm. it's self growth when i can't really when I feel like I'm down and I can't really, I've done all I can for self growth. I go back to the community. And yeah, uh, and you're you're you are helping the community by where you can be a help to the community. 
Mm -hmm. that's i mean that's my biggest thing is i'm of no use to anybody if i'm getting fucked up all the time or hung over all the time or you know so by fixing by getting myself healthy then i can you know really yeah be of use to people and 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 be part of the community um so so after you get out of rehab what are like what are three goals of yours once you get out well i got a ton of music planned for the year it's going to be a big year for me i mean um I don't mean a big year as far as like success, but just uh, I'm so I'm working on my favorite music I've ever made right now. Um, it's been a, the, the, by far the best part of quarantine. I've been I've had a lot of time to just work, and I'm loving what I'm doing. And my manager and I have pretty much the whole next like two years mapped out almost. Wow. Um, so I'm getting him some demos ready so before i leave so while i'm gone he's going to be shopping them around to see if we want to work with different distribution companies get some help getting on playlists and that kind of stuff and then when i'm back we're uh um you know pedal to the metal just kind of my thing now is making sure i have new content um or new music every month Ooh. um even it, it just even if it's just one song or one music video or something um but then i also want to have the podcast going every week or every two weeks i'm not sure Mm-hmm. um and so yeah it's just to stay busy and 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 so my main goals are probably um get these next projects out that i have planned um and stay very focused and, and, but don't let them get in front of my health and self-care right. um to, to, to always remember that it's okay to to miss a month if it means i got to get out of town for a little bit and and uh get my head right you know Mm-hmm. um yeah i guess those are some goals it's hard to make other goals right now because i not even fauci knows when we're gonna be fucking playing shows again so Gosh. do you have like any uh places you go to like escape to like reboot kind of yeah i mean like lately i've, I've been just going places where i don't have dealers on speed dial <laughs> like so like anywhere <laughs> Anywhere besides Seattle, like I'll, I'll rent an Airbnb on like Bainbridge or something. Okay. Um, yeah. and just go chill. So um, I'm very lucky enough that my family, my parents, and my little brother all live in Seattle right now. It wasn't always like that growing up. It was always we're always in different places. Mm-hmm. Um, so now I get to see them all the time, which has been awesome. So sometimes, um, like my dad and I will go get a place, cause uh, um, or the whole family just cause we everyone kind of needs it right now. We'll all put up a little bit and just, just get something that's outside of, let's buy some water maybe. And just for a weekend um, and just try to not watch the news for a weekend and like, <laughs> you know, turn off for a bit. And uh, you always feel better when you get back home. You always feel a little more rejuvenated and ready to, ready to kind of take on life. Yeah. Washington's the place to escape. There's so many different places. It's got the woods, got the deserts, yeah, man. ocean lakes. Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't need to go far to, to get that escape. It's right there. Mm-hmm. So with your podcast you're planning, are you going to have, like, on guests, or is it going to be, like, more of, like, solo gonna, podcasting? I'm th- uh, it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn as I go, for sure. I'm sure it's going to evolve a ton. Um, let, me, let me see what I wrote down right now. Um, so, podcast, 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 podcast. Um, it's I, I, it's going to start out solo a little bit similar to the vlogs I made already. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I might put those up on, you know, the Spotify and the, all the podcast, whatever streaming things. What's the main one that probably Apple. Um, I can give you like tips, honestly, if you need help with podcasting, like I, I learned all my, yeah. Can I ask you a couple just... of questions when we're done with this? Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. I honestly, at this point, I feel like there isn't one main podcast platform i think people are trying to think that spotify is the main podcast platform now but the only reason why is because fucking joe rogan has a hundred million dollars podcast deal which is like yeah but no one's getting really deals on (laughs) spotify for podcasts yeah yeah i I honestly think most people realistically listen to podcasts on like youtube yeah probably that's That's where i listen that's where i listen to mine because i I like i like the visuals also Mm mm-hmm um and then i just use a podcast app if i'm driving or something yeah i have a i have youtube premium so like you can i don't i think it was like 
2012 or some shit before before 2012 you were able to like exit out of your screen and still listen to youtube and then like around 2012 or something they made it so you had to fucking have like youtube red or youtube premium to yeah. be able to exit out of the browser and still hear the podcast but um, uh, yeah i recommend um i don't want to recommend anything to buy and shit but i i got the youtube premium or whatever and uh it is nice man to not have any ads i forgot when i see people with ads on their youtube i'm like oh, oh yeah God. that used to be my life having a fuck like i was wasting hours of a week <laughs> watching ads <laughs> mm-hmm. and then um, with youtube premium it comes with you i have a because i have a google phone like everything i do is google so like with youtube premium it comes with the youtube music as well which is pretty nice shit you gotta uh get me hip to that so i thought youtube music was just songs on youtube is there a difference so actually youtube music is just like spotify whatever platform and um so you have like all the albums all the top songs ranks just like how spotify is but what's better in my opinion about youtube music like if an artist releases like releases like a mixtape on youtube or like a remix that's not on streaming platforms it'll be on youtube you can just add it to your playlist like a normal song which i like appreciate got you i did not know that i'm gonna get down with that and they have a few questions about that for uh with podcast stuff that i'll ask you later but yeah Yeah. um oh yeah so my podcast there's i don't have much right now but i was basically i want to start it off i'm gonna make a a theme song which i'm excited for um start it off by just kind of catching them up on how i'm doing which will which right now at least will most likely be about my addiction my recovery I've I'm I'm haven't decided yet if I want to make one before I go off to rehab or after, because mm-hmm. um, I definitely want to tell them that I'm going out of town so that they don't think I died or whatever. Oh, God, yeah. I'm not I'm not gonna be able to post on socials or anything. Um, but yeah, so the first part is gonna be just catching them up with where I'm at. Um, there. Um, and then I want to have a story time section mm-hmm. where I tell because I just got a crazy life, my past. Um. And I just have so many stories that no one knows about that I want to. So I'll, I'll tell a quick story um, and then a quick movie review because uh, I'm, oh, I'm a big movie geek. And uh, I'll Hell just yeah. give one movie that I, whatever my a movie that I loved or, or hated of the week. Um, and then I'm going to give a sneak peek at new music that I'm working on. Um, play like a nice little snippet and then talk about where I am music wise for my fans that uh you know, because I, I was thinking having that at the end would be good so that people that are a fan of the podcast that are more into it for my recovery and stuff can have that. But then, um, you know, I wanted the real fans to, or the music fans to know that at, near the end is when I start talking about my music. Mm-hmm. I might I might have little titles that pop up, story time, or, or, yeah. or movie review. Um, and I want it to be pretty concise and, you know, like 30 to 45 minutes, I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's all I got so far. <laughs> well, that's dope. I think... I'm I'm still working on it, but I think podcasts, like if you want to be a successful podcast, that because there's so many podcast scenes just like being like an artist at this point. There's so many podcasts, there's so many artists out there. So ways to stand out are so important. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I want to eventually kind of turn my podcast into like a TV show type deal. Yeah, you know, nice. like different segments and stuff like that. Or like when you're talking about like doing story time, you should find mm-hmm some type of animator that's animating that story yeah. section, things like that. Like, it's just, there's just so many, cause I've been doing the zoom interviews for a while. Of course, like in person is so much better, but like after a while, seeing one picture on this side, one picture on that side kind of gets boring. Even if it's like, if I'm freaking talking to Drake, it's still people gonna be like, Oh, this is kind of looks boring yeah, yeah. Just to see side by side like that. So just ways to be creative. Cause there's so many freaking Someone's grandma could start a podcast tomorrow. Like yeah, it's yeah, easier yeah. to make a podcast than to make a song even. So standing totally. out is very important. And already, already having like a base to go off of, you have ideas, you got the fan base, like you're creative, wouldn't be hard. Yeah, thanks, man. That's good to hear because I'm, uh, yeah, it's something I'm really excited about. Hell yeah. Um, it's going down soon. Uh, just quick if you haven't seen this yet i I saw it recently and my my jaw was just on the floor um mike tyson interviewing lil boosie oh shit Um, yeah mike tyson has his own podcast called hot boxing and it's one of my favorite podcasts it's amazing and um even just the first 15 minutes of this interview because he just lil boosie thinks he's 
in it for a regular interview mm -hmm. like you know just about music and what you're doing and you know mike tyson's not about that he is a deep thinking guy he's too so blunt this, sometimes i feel like <laughs> oh my god he's so blunt he, he literally says you know how little boosie got in trouble for being a dick about Dwayne wade's kid yeah 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 that shit with like the transgender whatever. yeah yeah i don't yeah. want to say the wrong words but um but mike tyson one of the first questions he asked this guy and only mike tyson can say this to a gangster like little pussy he asked him uh like well do you think that maybe like since, <laughs> since you're so mean to people maybe that you're that you're gay why do you say things about um person that, you, uh, that might be a homosexual why do you say that about them do you feel the possibility that you're a homosexual and you by disrespect them you further yourself from being a homosexual or thinking you may like homosexuals nah nah i'm you know i'm i'm straight as an arrow i'm just saying you know i'm not I saying did, you are but why I, I do really, you have really, if I, you're straight why do you I really, I really, I really, I really commented on, on, on the Dwayne Wade situation yeah. because I got offended because, because it's a child, you know, that's why I, I really got offended, you know, and, and <laughs> maybe you, <laughs> and my jaw dropped to the floor, yes. <laughs> little Boosie's homies in the background, like, because, you know, and Boosie just had, couldn't, you know, my choice is terrifying. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was an amazing interview. You got to watch it. Have you seen his latest one with Bill Burr? Yeah, but I, I didn't finish it. I was bummed that he got a new co-host. Oh, um, dude, that fucking co-host reminds dude, me good. of someone's fucking counselor. He's like, he was literally asking things like, he was like trying to make the podcast continue by being like, so Mike, how does that actually make you feel? Like Mike Tyson can describe how he feels on his own. It yeah, was like, yeah, a, yeah. he was like narrating the podcast for Mike. I was like, who the fuck is this guy? Wait, is this the old, the old guy? The guy with the the newest episode with like Bill Burr, whoever oh, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, that guy. Fuck that guy's weird. Yeah, Jeremy, Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy Piven. He's from the show Entourage, and then he he got blackballed by Hollywood for doing something like grabbing a girl's ass or what? It's not one of those things during the Me Too thing. Oh, and shit. Uh, and now this is his latest gig, I guess. But maybe he'll get better. But right now, the other guy, Evan Evan Britton, was so good because he was just a he was just like a psychedelic guy that would just just so interested in what mike had to say and let mike talk yeah it was, mm -hmm. it was my favorite podcast so hopefully i'll still like it yeah that's funny as fuck that he was mike was just doing shrooms during the interview and he didn't even care about talking about it i was like holy shit oh my god that guy's yeah that's crazy i can never do that yeah what do you feel about i personally like podcasts or like even radio shows that are just like one person like a joe rogan or whoever Versus like having like co-hosts. Like what are your opinions? Like when you're listening to a podcast, do you prefer just one host or multiple, like a breakfast club or? Um, I prefer, uh, I prefer one host. I think um, I like when they have their kind of people that don't talk much, but they're sort of part of the podcast just because it, it, um, it can be weird if they're just alone, they know one to laugh at their jokes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um but there's definitely some co-host podcasts if they're two really funny comedians that are professionals and they don't they know when to keep the bit going when to talk over each other when not to yeah. you know then they can make it really enjoyable one is just two friends that aren't you know i don't know um, like the brilliant idiots that's my favorite podcast have you watched that yeah brilliant idiots is a great one um i also really like the other one with andrew schultz i think it's oh, called flagrant too flagrant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell yeah, with Akash Singh. Yeah, and I think they work really well together. Yes. So I guess I guess I don't have an opinion on which is better. Mm -hmm. There's there's just different. Um, I used to be a fan of Chris D'Elia's podcast when that was still a thing, and his sure. was just. And I like Bill Burr's podcast, and those and they're both um, just rants it's, almost. It's just them, no cuts, nothing, yeah. just talking for an hour. And some of the best, I would watch it, I would listen, or yeah, I, I liked watching um, Chris D'Elia's, but there'd always be at least one part in it that just killed me. Yes. It always put me in a good mood, so. <laughs> How do you feel about The Breakfast Club? Like, after watching, like, The Brilliant Idiots or even, like. Fuck The Breakfast you know, Club. <laughs> Charlemagne has, like, a, occasionally he'll do, like, individual interviews. Like, he has one with, like, Meek Mill. Or it's just him and Meek Mill or that things like that. I feel like yeah, I think Charlemagne's really smart. Um, I I can't really stand DJ Envy. Oh my! God. Um, he just doesn't. Good morning, he, everybody. He always, oh, he's good at that. DJ Envy. <laughs> DJ Envy. He's good at that shit, but he's just. I feel like he always derails a conversation, and his questions aren't good. Oh but, my god! Yeah. 
but maybe he's, he probably still adds, you know, brings it all together in a way. Um, but like, you know, their radio, you can't even cuss there and stuff, right? Maybe you can now or something. I think um, what they do is it's, what's really weird is they have, and they somehow, they're, I think, I don't know if the podcast awards has passed yet. That's how big podcasts are now. There's like podcast awards, just like the Oscars, the Grammys or whatever. And all they've done is put their entire radio show onto like a podcast platform. So it, it still includes the commercials. It bleeps out everything. But then on YouTube, when they're interviewing whoever, Kanye or whatever, Mm-hmm. those individual interviews on YouTube, they're not censored, which I like. But, like, listening to their yeah. whole, sh- whole show is gotcha. kind of boring, in my opinion. Totally. I mean, but you can't deny that Breakfast Club has given us some incredible moments in history. Oh gosh. Yeah. Drake? Drake? Some of the best moments of all time. Yeah. it's They're they're going to go down as one of the best radio. Oh, for sure. for sure. Legends, for sure. Yeah. But, yeah, it's definitely evolving from that into more of a – yeah well they're evolving too then i guess but yeah yeah beauty above podcasts is you say whatever you want like no no one wants to listen to a late night interview like Mm -hmm. a talk show like with an audience that's all planned and scripted and it's so boring it freaks me out honestly i don't i've been like um so weird i've been doing like film editing and stuff for like promo videos or like interviews yeah i i I understand like how stock footage works and everything like that Mm -hmm. and like or even like when it's like a you can tell the difference between like a movie set and like a tv set like usually like or a low budget movie or a low budget tv show like you'll you they won't they won't be like a full frame of like what's going on because it's a set so there's no roof and stuff like that and mm-hmm. stuff like that kind of like weirds me out totally or like yeah it's freaky it feels like a black mirror episode or something <laughs> yeah i think we've, we've gone we've gone to a point like even though we have like all this technology and stuff people are in dire need of organicness Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So let's just touch on the Seattle music scene just like one more time. Like, yep. what, are you, what is your opinion on the Seattle scene now? Like, I feel like after like doing all this research and starting to work with like older artists in the scene, I feel like there was a point like even in like 2016 when I like look at all the artists that like wrecked their peak almost then. I was like, it almost seemed like the trajectory was just going to be insane from 2016 on or even like Macklemore in 2012. But now, like, when I'm talking to older artists or artists who have been around even for, like, three years or something, they all kind of feel stuck right now. Even before the pandemic, they, they feel like there's no media outlets. They don't feel like there's no connections. Yeah. Huh. But it really seems like 2016, 2012 to 2016 was a huge, like, burst in the scene. Yeah, I mean, that was right during my time, I guess, when it, when I was very um, into community and, and uh, you know, me, Raz, Dave, uh, Gab, uh, I'm, I'm missing so many people. Nacho, um, we were all at the same, every show we were all there, um, no matter whose it was, we were, you know, um, it f- felt very connected. Um, I'm not going to have a great answer for you on this because I'm sort of, or at least right now, feeling, been feeling very distanced from the scene. Mm. Um, I mean, mostly because of the pandemic, but also because getting older um, and not being someone who, I was, you know, uh, uh, I was out on Capitol Hill partying with these guys every night. And then once that became not part of my life, um, my, you know, it's, it's more just about the music for me. And uh, I still work with like a lot of the same people, but I just don't really, I don't know if I'd call it a scene, right? You mm-hmm. know, it's not like we all, we used to all meet up at the same bar every night. And that really felt like a scene, you know, Big Mario's or Numo's or somewhere on Capitol Hill. We were literally all on the block, like every rapper in Seattle you would know or that had a name, just like kicking it outside of Numos. And mm-hmm. that felt like a scene, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, and also I'm older, so the there could be this whole underground scene of young people that I don't really know about. <laughs> right. And I'm sure there is. And, uh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm allergic to the scene. <laughs> oh man, no, but uh, yeah, uh, I think that it's, I should be feel a little more responsibility to tap into the young people and see what's going on there. Might you know, I love working with the uh, with the youth. Keeps me young, um, mm-hmm. and they they got some dope ideas, and there's a lot of talent out there. So I'm I'm always looking for new artists to work with in Seattle. Always down. I feel like it's just that's like this. It's like the rap um stereotype. Like 30 is not old to be an artist, really. 
No, no. Um, it's like I, I, it was something I had to come to terms with, and I love talking about it now because it's so. It was such a a sense of like embarrassment and fear for me, or like not embarrassment, like insecurity, like I, because of the idea of you know being banana goo pie stoner rapper at age thirty felt like that's not just. Um, I was just insecure about that kind of thing, and then, but then with age, my music matured and. Um, I have no, I, I no longer have a fear of like getting older and it's just something that whether it's rap music, whether it's, um, more pop or, you know, some of the stuff I'm doing, it feels that it's like more indie rock. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just, I'm going to be an artist forever. Oh, yeah. Um, that's not something I can control. It's not something that I have, that I, I hope that I don't have like a real prime ever, you know, I, I want to keep, um, keep learning and, uh. And it's something I love, you know. So now I'm I'm looking forward to my 30s and uh, and maturing as an artist and being known as more of an artist creative rather than um, a party rapper guy, you know. Yeah. Just look at our Lord and Savior Eminem, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, he never changed. Up. See, I, where I'm so different than that is he kind of stuck with the same thing, and it started getting corny. Yeah. And like, like his rapping and rapping fast and all that, you know, I like to think, of my, I mean, this is obviously an insane comparison I don't, that I don't, I'm not comparing myself at all, but more of a Kanye type that, okay. that um, it, can make a graduation and then, and then make an auto-tune album and then make a Yeezus, you know, like try new things and, and uh, not, you know, that, you know, the new Eminem's going to album is going to be fucking. Nice. Eminem rapping fast on some beats yeah. you know it's not like exciting but I um I get excited when when like the new Pharrell project comes out oh, you know yeah. the new Andre and like the new uh Cuddy like you don't know what to expect you know Kid Cuddy might make a really weird speeding bullet album where it's like him like a like a grunge album and then he might make you know you never know and that's and that I feel like age doesn't matter because you're like i also like beck a lot like he yeah. might put out a rap album randomly and then put out and he's he's old he's still rapping he's older so, so beastie mm. boys i love their trajectory how they they were in their 60s just still making creative shit because they love doing it mm -hmm. um and you didn't know if it was going to be rap or like just instrumental or what yeah. and uh yeah i feel like there's more longevity being an artist rather than being an aging rapper <laughs> yeah artist is the new word not just like being a rapper or yeah well we're all, well, all 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 rappers are artists but you know yeah. what i mean like for sure um i can't see eminem putting out his uh his 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 folk album anytime soon <laughs> oh my gosh yeah the um that kid cuddy album though the speeding bullet to heaven i think that's what yeah, it's called yeah. mm -hmm. that was so like i feel like it needed more attention that was actually a pretty Crazy it's a very polarizing album. It's some, um, a lot of like big, like the needle drop. I remember randomly specifically. He's a huge um, uh, music reviewer guy. Mm -hmm. That, that um, he gave that one. One of the only zero out of ten rep reviews he's ever given was to that. <laughs> oh shit! But then on to three thousand one time on an interview said it was one of his favorite albums of the year. So I'm just like. It's, it's it's interesting, you know, and that's dope. Yeah, has he hasn't released? Oh, he was on the. Andre was just on a. He was on the Goody Mob album, which was a total. I interviewed Goody Mob, but um, their newest their newest album was very, in my opinion, very disappointing. Yeah, don't tell them I said that. Though. But <laughs> like they they had um, they had on, which was random as hell. They had Big Boy on one song. Yeah, and like right afterwards they had Andre. Yeah, they yeah, could have yeah. just combined them together <laughs> and made an outcast song if they had both of them on the album. But it was yeah, like, I guess so. It's annoying. Yeah. I heard an interesting interview with Andre that you should listen to. You maybe already have with Rick Rubin. Oh, um, sure. They talked for like an hour and Andre explains why he doesn't make music. And it's, it's pretty sad, but also enlightening. So, yeah. yeah. So, Sam Chow, what is some advice that you have for up and coming artists? Creators, All right. Let's do some. Hmm. Um, one would be to be very careful when it comes to owning your masters. 
um, be careful when you're making music that you will come to agreements with people on who owns the song um, and who's, you know, a paid musician or a feature or, or a producer you're buying a beat from, whatever. Cause that, that kind of, that stuff, um, if all goes well, that stuff will end up being a problem in the future because mm -hmm. that means you're making money. <laughs> um, also owning your masters and just not, um, a, a, looking for a good distribution deal is, is dope. Um, but make sure that you own your masters because you can do it all yourself. And, uh, you know, I've been able to make, I make a living off streaming money, which I'm so blessed from, you know, and that it took a long time, but, um, it is possible to sort of create a career out of this without getting signed to a label um, or blowing up with one big ass song on, on a lyrical lemonade or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, so just to remember it's possible and to be, to be patient and, um, and smart and, and focus on your branding um, as much as the music and don't and focus on making good music. Not if you're focused on making a hit song, um, I, I, I don't know the long it's going to be hard to have a long uh, a, a much longevity and and uh but and it's just like you're, that's like winning the lottery you know <laughs> focus on your craft and uh and it's then it's not like winning the lottery then you just put then you can then it's just possible you can get good you know um if you put the time in um what else um oh yeah one of the uh connections and relationships are more important than money in the long run always and don't hold grudges pay people sometimes even though you know they don't deserve it but because they because you're not gonna miss that dollars in a couple of years but but you don't you don't need that harbor inside you that anger resentment um or that lawsuit don't <laughs> or the lawsuit of course yeah but it's more just but like you know because I've, I've paid people that i would have won the lawsuit easily and not had to pay them but mm -hmm. i but then i just you know talked to like my friends and was like why am i tripping about this six hundred dollars he says i owe him when you know like i would rather just be on good terms with them and, and get to sleep at night without like this shit building in me you know mm -hmm. um and uh yeah, and be careful with drugs. <laughs> careful with drugs, kids. Uh, for real though, the, the, there's fentanyl out there now, and um, a lot of music is is a. Uh, I don't think it's glorifying drugs on purpose. I think they're just talking about what they do, which is what hip hop's always been about. But yeah. I do think it glorifies unintentionally, definitely glorifies drug use, and um, these drugs are insanely addictive now, um, especially the opioids and the mm -hmm. benzos that are really popular music right now. Um, and, and even if, if you don't get addicted, you can still die easy from it getting laced with some shit. So, uh, be careful out there. We've had enough people die. That's all I got. Yeah. I actually have two more things now that I think about it. Yeah. Also, you should make a dare album. Maybe. <laughs> no, cause I'm, <laughs> I'm not the one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so did you, were you part of the Seattle sessions at all? Like chase fade thing? I was out of town shooting a music video with Justin Frick, but I would have popped in. Hmm. Cause I, yeah. I heard that um, people like Little Mosey and like Macklemore are able to just like send their like tracks in without even being part of the sessions. I don't know if you're gonna disappear. Yeah, on the track. Um, I was supposed to. Me and Chase were talking. I was supposed to get on one. We couldn't. We just couldn't find the right track. Mm. Um, yeah, and I'm sort of making up uh, my own posse shit right now too. Not competing with his whatsoever. But I got a new Young Seattle coming out soon that I'm really excited oh, about. Hell yeah. um, I'm down to release the uh, lineup right now for the first time. Um, dun, dun, dun. dun, dun, dun. Starts out me, and then it's Django. From, he's from Spokane, but he's I dope. Django. Nice. Then Django. Then it's Jay Park, the Korean fucking killer. <laughs> and then it's um, uh, Niles Davis, who I really like. Um, then it's Mr. DC, who I really like. Oh, my gosh. Then it's Laze. Oh my um, gosh. Then it's uh, Vrilla, who's who's a young guy up and coming, Ryan Caraveo's little brother. Um, and then it's Lorelai, who's this dope singer who's up and coming. Oh, I've had Lorelai on my podcast. Nice. I love and that's Lorelei. the lineup. 
pretty cool, right? Oh my gosh, man, that is. I'll I mean, send you like, the rough draft. That's like a music orgasm for me, man. Like I knew nice. every single person on that. I'm gonna shoot you the rough draft right now. Just don't. Oh, you can nice. show people, but don't send it to to anybody. Yeah, for sure, dude. Yeah, that's gonna be dope as fuck. This is probably the latest because I can do it on chat, right? Yeah, let's end the interview though before I send this shit. Cool. Um, and then we can keep chatting about the podcast real quick. I think there was one last thing I was gonna say, but I uh, think I forgot. So let's just wrap it up. This is the NAS pod. Oh, actually, what is the easiest way for fans to reach out to you? Um, text me. Um, on my phone number is the best way, and for you to stay updated on everything, you can also um um instagram at sam lachow is what i do I, I i still do twitter a little bit um but my main thing that i'm always on is instagram at sam lachow um but then you can text me at 2201206201946 and uh i won't always be able to text everyone back but i but i uh i do it when i can i love talking to you guys and it's uh and you'll, then you'll stay updated before anyone else on the new stuff because uh, it's it sort of works as a mailing list as well, but uh, but with text. So you don't have to be good at checking your emails and shit. Hell yeah. Well, this is the NAS podcast with... Sam LeChow. What's there going go. on? Thank you so much. I had a blast, man. Keep it Hell up. Yeah. Keep up the hard work. I uh, love what you're doing. And uh, thanks for having me, man.